Until this moment, I have not met my first guest by chance. His name is John DeLorean, and a man uh, whose face you've recently seen in a very familiar place, that is the, the front page of your uh, paper. And uh, once again, uh, as we sit here now, Mr. DeLorean is in serious legal trouble. I don't think anyone envies him the past few years of his life, who's in his right mind. Uh, Mr. DeLorean has written a, a book and says that he can explain everything. Uh, so here, to explain everything in limited time, Mr. John DeLorean. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Have a seat. Well, yeah, I think I laid rather a heavy burden on you there. But uh, let, let me start in an unfamiliar way. You've been through enough to uh, put you in a biblical category of uh, Job's uh, trials or something. What effect, how, how, how unhappy are you at the moment? Let's oh, put I'm, it like I'm, that. I'm not unhappy. I have a, really a deep spiritual commitment, and I have yeah. tremendous strength and a and a very powerful feeling that all will eventually work out all right. You do feel that? Yes, sir. So how awful do you feel? I don't feel It's not a good question. Uh, no, I don't feel bad at all. I think that it's yeah. unfortunate that I'm subject to this continual harassment. As you know, the government was very embarrassed by th what happened to them out here in California. They got caught doing every illegal thing that the FBI has ever done, breaking in, stealing documents, backdating documents, fabricating evidence, threatening my attorney, threatening mm -hmm. witnesses. And, and in the end, uh, I was told when I won mm -hmm. that case that they would come after me again and again as long as I live. So I've now yep. made that part of my life. How many people do you think perceive you as the victim you perceive yourself as and aren't sitting here saying, this guy got off scot-free? Well, I don't know that I think of myself as a victim. I think mm -hmm. you know, it's a combination of circumstances. And, you know, as I said in my book, I freely accept the responsibility. My, my uh, arrogance and my gigantic ego got me in a lot of trouble when the British yeah. government refused to support my business. If I were a normal, rational guy, I would have said, if they don't want it, I don't want it. And I should have taken a walk and gotten another job. Instead, because yep. that car had my name on it, I was going to fight it out to the end. And as a consequence, uh, I had to be broken, <laughs> and here I am. Yeah. Uh, at what point in this scenario of your life could you, if you had it to live over now, could you have not brought all this down on your head? Well, I don't know that there was a point. I think mm -hmm. some of those events were out of my control, and certainly uh, uh, the arrogance had to be taken out of me. I believe that the I also don't think I'm alone in that. I look around now and I uh -huh. see a lot of my counterparts in the business and political world have a lot of the same disease I had. Potential DeLoreans out there who face a, as much trouble as you? Well, maybe not as much trouble, but it's certainly, you know, the, the Bible classifies pride as the deadliest sin, and it is because countries have been destroyed, uh, businesses, mm -hmm. institutions. The other vices, uh, lust is usually involves two people and murder maybe two or three, but but uh, pride normally is the thing that destroys nations. Yeah. You made one or two reference to the Bible. Uh, I think everybody must know that you have had a, it would born again be the right phrase or a Christian conversion? Yeah, born uh, again is the right phrase. Were you uh, sort of moderately religious before? Uh, no, I've always been uh, uh, extremely religious. For the 10 years before this mm -hmm. happened to me, I went to St. Patrick's Cathedral every single morning of my life for an hour, usually at 6.45, 7 o'clock. Yeah. And I did the ritualistic things that we Catholics have always done. I lit the candles and went through Mass if it was time for that. But I really didn't have a proper relationship with Christ. And, and I think that's the good thing that's come out of this experience, and it far outweighs all of the bad. Mm -hmm. uh, over the years, we've seen a number of criminals, uh, people in jail, Charles Colson, and others come out with um, a Bible in their hands and a religious conversion. Some of us are skeptical of those things. Oh, reasonably uh, so, but you, you have to remember two things. One is when your life is going beautifully, uh, you don't have an occasion to reassess it and take a new look. And so mm -hmm. consequently, it's not unusual that there are so-called foxhole conversions. I think it's also true that, you know, what, 80% of the New Testament was written in prison. And Colson, I think his life is infinitely more relevant now than it was when he was the power behind the throne. He is a, a, an mm -hmm. American who is going to change the world. Yeah. Probably the one image most people have of you is that 
historic, notorious moment of videotape that we saw, what, a hundred times uh, replayed on television? A hundred thousand times. The secretly taped moment in which, sort of dandling a bag of cocaine on your lap, you said, it's better than gold. It would seem like anyone not institutionalized <clears throat> would have known at that <laughs> moment to say, I'm calling the cops, if he expects us to believe, as you do, that you didn't mean any of that. Well, you got to remember, I was acting under the advice of attorneys. I was told to go along with the game because they threatened the lives of my children and myself. Yeah. And the other thing was mm. that uh, even in the stand, you know, when you're in the room with three people who you think are organized crime members, and that particular morning I was reading the New York Times on the airplane from New York to, to California where I had been ordered to appear under threat again. Yeah. Uh, there was a story about a young Colombian and his Mercedes and his head was blown off and his wife's and their 10-year-old child mm -hmm. on the Long Island Freeway, again, by mm -hmm. these kind of people. So uh, I, I was concerned only for my family, and uh, maybe there was a more rational thing, but I don't think standing up and saying, I'm going to the police with three men you know to be armed and dangerous is a logical yeah. thing to do. Well, I know <clears throat> probably when we all saw that, we thought, <clears throat> sorry, they certainly have the goods on him. There's no way he's going to get out of this. Well, one. that's what it was designed and if for. If you had hired a script writer to say, what possible out can we give for this character? Of course, it would be exactly the one you had said, which is, well, of course, I didn't do what I should have because I thought it was they were crooks and they were going to blow my head off. Well, uh, this could be coincidence or... <clears throat> you, you, I know you detect a note of skepticism in my voice, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not alone in that. Uh, I know that people who know you well was Robert Shear, who interviewed you for Playboy, yes. concluded that maybe you were, he decided you were a sucker, really. A guy so wrapped up in himself, so ego riddled, that you were, in effect, sucked into that, a, a sitting duck for it, and that maybe, in fact, you were not a brilliant con man, but a true victim with a great ego problem. Uh, you buy that? Well, Mr. Shear and I had a lot of trouble, as you may or may not know, but he originally interviewed me on the assumption that the article was going to appear in the Los Angeles Times, and I suddenly get a phone call from Playboy saying he'd sold it to them. So he and I had a great deal of animosity well, between us that. because I felt I'd been betrayed. I didn't really yeah. want to appear in Playboy. I think it's alien to, to my newfound religion. At one point you referred to being over by the press a lot, and then you suddenly said, uh, Wait, please don't print that. I don't want naughty words to appear. I'm yeah, I got very excited with but him, and I shouldn't have said that. That's that, true. Uh, why not? I noticed even there you blamed your 13-year-old son for, for the fact that you knew such dirty words. Well, I didn't learn that from him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard it during your introduction. No, no, you're, <laughs> it's the acoustic. But um, what... I guess that almost everyone has spoken to you by now except me, and I, I thought Donahue did a brilliant job of... Uh, did you enjoy that experience? Well, I'm what you experience? call an easy, cheap shot. On the other hand, yeah. I think I have a, a, a reasonable story to tell. I think there are two things. Uh, you know, obviously, because of the of what happened in the trial, I, it was unnecessary for me to present a defense because mm -hmm. the government essentially proved I was innocent all by themselves. Of course, with the help of my attorney, who I think is the brilliant cross-examiner, maybe since Clarence Apparently. Darrow. Yeah. yeah, he really yeah. is, because he caught all these lies and these terrible mistakes and the horrible things they did. Mm -hmm. Well, then we decided not to present our defense and spend another three months in court because the jurors were all convinced that, you know, I was absolutely innocent anyhow. And so this mm -hmm. book does two things. It tells my side of the story, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not as uh, worried about whether people believe it or not with the right today. My yeah. only entry, my, the only guy I'm worried about convincing is up there and he uh -huh. knows you don't kid him. The other thing is I really believe that something has got to be done about the laws in this country so that an innocent man basically, I don't know if you remember Forgive me interrupting you in the midst of that sentence but <laughs> it's uh, for no other motive than that we have a message and we have to come back. So we'll be back with John DeLorean. Stay with us. Talking with uh, former automaker John DeLorean. Um, Mr. Carson, a fellow Nebraskan, uh, 
had one of your cars, I remember, and offered me a ride in it one time. But I didn't trust things that opened this <laughs> way. Uh, did he and the other stars who invested in, in you lose money? Uh, yeah, a lot of our clearly. investors were, of course, primarily tax shelter, well-to-do people, wealthy people who were investing yeah. for tax shelter. Now it's a, a lot of information has surfaced really in recent weeks that would indicate and prove the, the fact that the British government put us out of business. We didn't go out of business. For example, mm -hmm. a few months back when it looked like my company was going to start again, the British government took the body dies, which is a single most expensive and complex component of our car and they took them out in the middle of Galway Bay and threw them in the ocean and uh, the man who was trying to buy them uh, from Columbus, Ohio, Marvin Katz, sent a scuba diver down with a strobe light and sure as shooting, there they are laying on the ocean floor, DeLorean motor cars, Belfast, Northern Ireland, 18 million dollars worth of the most beautiful dyes you've ever seen. And of course, if you want any proof of conspiracy, I think that does that, it. That's fairly solid. That you, sure maybe is. Maybe you're the man for whom the witty line was written, even a paranoid has some real enemies. No, I know, don't think I'm paranoid No, I've all. forgotten who was who said that. I think it was uh, Delmore Schwartz, the poet. But I also believe that, that we will ultimately recover the investments of all of the investors. And, and we're really? Bringing, well, it's a lot like Freddie Laker. You know, he, who was a better friend to Great Britain than he was? And he just won a $68 million judgment from the British government for destroying his company. He was the one that allowed poor Americans who could afford a $159 trip to visit England and spend mm -hmm. billions of dollars. By the way, I think everybody probably assumes you've always been a rich man, those who don't know your uh, background, and possibly some sympathy is created when people find out that you had immigrant parents and you worked your way up, which I think probably most people know. Um, but so many things you've done seem bizarre, even for someone under all the pressure you were. There was a period in your life you talk about in the book where you were paid $10,000 to a mystic so your wife could have a baby. Uh, oh, she I, did. You've she, always been too smart she, for that, haven't no, you? No, no, she did that. I paid her a lot more than 10000 It was oh. in, what, in the middle six figures. But <laughs> although a few of those people are genuine, they're almost always charlatans. Did that bother you? Or? Well, uh, I think it's symptomatic. Looking back today, I can't conceive of a rational human being doing what I did. But it, but, In many you know, areas. But uh, see, I think what had happened is I really had no one to talk to. If I ever went to my employees and said, look, at the, the British government has pulled our financing. It's a disaster. They would have all left. Mm -hmm. And of course, every potential investor you met, you had, they'd say, how, how are things? They're magnificent. They're, you know, and yeah. so now I suddenly am isolated. I have no one to talk to. And somehow I wound up talking to this psychic, even in the least detail of my life. If I were hiring a secretary, I would consider and discuss it with her. But I can't today imagine how that ever happened to me. Would you say you're sort of without friends? Are you a lonely man? Today? Yeah. No, I have some very good friends, but I'm mm -hmm. building different kinds of relationships than I've had in the past. I was yeah. quite surprised at what happens to you when a little trouble beckons. <laughs> a large, painful subject, but interesting, I thought, in the Playboy interview was to talk about your, what some people would view as your wife's hypocrisy or perfidy or whatever, that at the um, end of your, right at the very end of the trial, you found that she had been uh, unfaithful and uh, divorced you and this this may have been all you needed as they say at this time that must have been a body blow that was it was there. devastating because mm -hmm. uh, while I you know went through the trial very well mm -hmm. and, uh, and when that happened I think I went into really depression and I lost about 35 pounds over the next 90 days which yeah. I still have off but the, uh, I, I can also be understanding, I don't think any marriage could have survived the terror that the government subjected my family to and my children, my wife, all of our friends were gone, all the things that mm -hmm. we believed in, a reputation that I'd worked for 35 years to put together, every, you know, everything disappeared. And so I can understand. You can see her point. In no, there. I think it's uh, quite common, for example, uh, 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 Pat Robertson was telling me that when a couple has a child who dies from, say, leukemia, where you've gone through a period where both of you agonize over this beautiful thing that you love slowly perishing before you, it's almost inevitable that they divorce afterward because Certainly of some true. psychological impact of the whole thing. Yeah. Do you find, though, that you, I noticed even in your phrasing there, you said what the government did to my children. Can't you say what you did to them, too, in a way? I mean, if, if you hadn't done anything, the government wouldn't have That's absolutely you know. not true. Do you know how I was selected? I was uh, the confidential informant 
was sitting six months before they ever called me on a telephone, was sitting in the federal building in Los Angeles waiting to testify. He had mm -hmm. three agents with him, one of whom was later to become the case agent. That's the, yeah. Yeah, and he was, incidentally, in that case, he put his two best friends in prison, but uh, he was reading the Wall Street Journal and he saw an article saying that my company needed money. Mm -hmm. And he turned to the agent, the case agent, Gerald Scotty, who testified to this in court, unrefuted, and he said, hey, I met this guy once, I can nail him for you. He really needs money. Now here's a man who has never been arrested once in his life for speeding, much less anything else. Suddenly I've been portrayed as an arch criminal. I mean, that's yeah. ridiculous. So did I do it? I don't know, maybe I did. Can you see why a lot of people love to see you take this gigantic public pratfall there? Oh, of course, that's here you are. human you, nature. You look like Every... a movie leading man. You have one of the most beautiful wives in the world, a $5 million penthouse or whatever. Uh, all I had a shattering there. experience once when I was with General Motors. I was up in the 14th floor executive dining room at the time that Jack Kennedy got a hold, I think the guy's b named Blau, who was the head of U.S. Steel, had raised right. prices in violation of not the legal but the suggested guidelines and of course the Kennedy immediately descended on him with all of his economists and U.S. Steel was subject to tremendous public humiliation and being forced to retract their prices and everybody in the room here's all these executives who are identical to Blau they're all laughing at at his shame and it shows you even mm -hmm. even your peers uh, don't have any sympathy they like to see a big guy fall. Well, great. Frenchman once said there's something not altogether unpleasant in the misfortunes of our friends. <laughs> in, in the 30 seconds remaining, you state in the Playboy piece that 50% of industry, cor giant corporations in this country, are owned by the mafia and imply that anybody's a fool who doesn't I realize didn't, I that. I didn't say that. You, you, well, it's in the ar article that's, where these. No, that's not true. Because the man, I'm sure, says. Do, do no, you, that's not it, true. Well, are, are 6%? Um, I would think more than that. Yeah. Are owned by you, or what you, was organized? They're not organized crime anymore. Yeah. Once you your the money becomes legitimatized, you know a lot of the the millionaires at the turn of the century, the so-called robber barons, were indeed robber barons. And yeah. of course, two generations later, they become pretty legitimate, and they look down on the rest of us who are struggling to make a living. Mr. Delorean, thank you for being here. It's a great um, pleasure, Dick. And uh, as a human being, I wish you well. <laughs> Do you think the rest of your life will be better than the, this much? Well, I understand that. Uh, I understand the government now has come up with some new charges, and going through the National yeah. Archives, they found that the that uh, with a new forensic process the FBI has developed, they found that on the theater tickets Mrs. Lincoln had my fingerprints appear. <laughs> they, they seem to have gone to an extreme. Is that the point of that? Well, th again, thanks for being here, John DeLorean. It's my we'll pleasure. You. We'll see you uh, at the moment. Uh, Joe Piscopo will be joining us shortly.